So basically what I'd like to talk to you about is what the heck I've been doing for the last eight, uh, 12 months, uh, working on a range of projects trying to reduce pesticide pollution going out to the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, forgive me the, for some of you who've seen these slides, first few slides before, but it's just to help with the introduction. Um, the Great Barrier Reef is located off the east coast of Australia, right, basically running down the entire length of Queensland. It's about two and a half thousand kilometres long. It's by far the world's largest uh, reef ecosystem and it was declared a World Heritage Site back in 1981. It truly is quite an amazing uh, spectacle to see and it really is a, one of the world's great wonders, natural wonders. I put that slide there not just to uh, make you feel jealous because I'm going sailing there in <laughs> June, um, but because to emphasise the link between the Great Barrier Reef and the land via the rivers that drain the land. So basically whatever's happening on the land is also via the rivers having an effect on the water quality and on the Great Barrier Reef. And it's important to realise when I say reef, the Great Barrier Reef, I'm not just talking about the coral that you saw with one of the photos here with the dugong eating seagrass there. That's just as important a component of the Great Barrier Reef. So like all ecosystems around the world, we're putting them under a whole diverse range of different stresses. Some of those are shown here. Typically the top ones are sort of man-made or certainly the flood plumes are uh, exacerbated by man, whereas the bottom line shows natural stresses. So we have cyclones, you, other people might call them hurricanes, tornadoes, etc. But they're very large, very strong wind systems. We have the crown of thorn starfish, which is a natural animal, a uh, native animal, but it devours coral. And we have coral bleaching due to excessive uh, increases in water temperature. And we have the El Nino La Nina weather cycle, which is again a natural thing. Um, and basically, the ones with the ticks have been, are being exacerbated by the change in our climatic systems. So, particularly with the La Nina, the, um, the uh, times when we're getting the drought conditions in Australia are kind of becoming more frequent and the droughts seem to be becoming more severe. Just to give you an idea of its size, uh, the tr area we're trying to manage comes to about 770,000, nearly three quarters of a million uh, square kilometres. I have no idea what that is in miles, my apologies. But that's basically the size of the UK and France combined, or if you like to think about it, you might like that, 10 Scotland's various combinations. So it really is a large scale project to try and manage. And unfortunately, the Great Barrier Reef is without, without doubt in decline. It's a bit like some of the depressing figures we get from DEFRA, where you know, since the last 20 years, hedgehog numbers have been declining by 50%, birds, etc. It's equally not um, a good situation on the Great Barrier Reef. So, Glenn Diath has shown that coral cover has declined by 50% in the last 27 years. Um, and associated with that, there's been decreases in the abundance of seagrasses and the organisms that require those sorts of uh, uh, those ecosystems. Unfortunately, back in 2016 and 17, we also had two consecutive years where we had a very large scale coral bleaching events due to um, water coming through the El Nino and just sitting over the coral reef. And unfortunately, particularly in the 2016 year, basically 93% of the reef was affected and bleached. So that's when they expel the zooxanthellae. Fortunately, just because they expel the zooxanthellae doesn't mean they all die. It does depend on how long the uh, increased temperatures are as to whether they can recover quite well or they in fact die. 
Fortunately, we haven't had a third year of, of that. So the Australian and Queensland governments are trying to ensure that the reef remains a viable entity for the future, and they've developed what we call the 2050 Reef Long-Term Sustainability Plan. And just the fact they put 2050 out the front, they're really trying to look to the, to the long term. And they're trying to cover a whole variety of different aspects which place various pressures on the reef and the land adjacent to that. Because of my experience, I'm working mainly in this area of water quality. And there we have what we call the 20 Reef 2050 Water Quality Improvement Plan. And that basically sets out targets and it's, it's, a, it's a plan for how do we improve the water quality, as it says. But with any plan, you actually have to have something that implements it and reports on the progress that, you're being, that is being made. And that's done through the Paddock to Reef Integrated Monitoring, Modelling and Reporting Program, or the P2R as we, P2R as we, we call it. Michael. Yes? Where's Paddock? Oh, Paddock is um, our Australian term for, f uh, like, a uh, field. But ours are slightly larger than your fields, typically. So, but that's, that's the word for a field, paddock. Um, and part of that, the key public communication in the reporting is the annual reef report card, which tells everybody how, what progress has been made to reaching the targets and the health of the reef overall. So in terms of that water quality improvement plan, they've focused in on three main stresses suspended solids, nutrients and pesticides, and the reasons for that are shown here. And you, you're probably very familiar with that. Obviously, pesticides, they're designed to kill. So when they get off the farmlands into the waterways, they have, can have the same effects. Nutrients can lead to excessive algal growth, which can smother the coral. It also, very importantly, increases the survival of the crown of thorn starfish, so maybe rather than 99% of them dying in the larval stage, maybe 97% die. And so we can get these plagues of coral, of, of the crown of thorn starfish, and they literally spread from where they the source, and they just munch their way through the coral reef. They're incredibly destructive. So, but that is their uh, increased frequencies of those is related to farming practices, applying fertilizers. Suspended solids, it's, it's a lot to do with poor um, farm management practices, but it can lead to decreased light penetration, so less photosynthesis of the corals and of the weeds, the seagrasses. It can actually physically smother organisms as well. And it can, they can also transport pollutants that are bound to them. So I mentioned targets. There are targets to try and improve the land management practices on our paddocks. And also water quality improvement targets as well. And the aim is that if we can improve land management practices, uh, they will improve the water quality and hopefully that will allow the goal of the plan to uh, be reached. And the plan is to have the water entering, entering into the reef having no detrimental effects on the health and the resilience of the reef. I'm going to be talking mainly about these water quality targets because that's where some of my work has been focused. But basically, the targets were to decrease the anthropogenic, the non-natural loads, which is the annual mass, if you like, how many tons or how many kilos of pesticides, um, dissolved inorganic nitrogen, sediment and particulate nutrients are being transported out to the reef. The target was to decrease the total amount of pesticides by 60%, at least 60%. Oh dear. Um, how do I, does anyone know how I shrink that? Oh. Very, sorry, surprised I could do that. Um, and d decrease DIN by 50% at least, and at least a 20% decrease for sediment and particulate nutrients. Importantly, that was just a single target, and it applied to all catchments right throughout the reef. 
um, irrespective of their current condition. So in some ways it wasn't a particularly sensitive um, measure. It was a bit of a getting a sledgehammer out to crack a nut type approach. Now there were certainly some problems with the previous approach. I've only just put a few which are related to the projects I've been working on. So the first one is that the <coughs> pardon me, previous pesticide reduction targets were aimed to re reduce the load. And the load is not related to the toxic effects that pesticides have. So that if you looked at the loads, as I'll show later, and use that to determine your management strategies, you c it could misdirect your efforts. And as I said, they were applied to all catchments. There are lots of detected pesticides for which we do not have water quality guidelines. And what that basically means is we don't have a, an easy way to determine whether the concentrations that we're measuring are having harmful effects on the environment or not. We don't know how bad the pesticide pollution is because traditional risk assessments only assess one pesticide at a time. But we know they occur in mixtures. We also don't monitor in, in all the waterways which discharged out to the reef. There's about 790 of those. Obviously, we can't monitor all of those. So we have no idea, really, what some of those unmonitored um, waterways are doing. And importantly, um, there's no good advice that can be given to farmers and other um, stakeholders who actually want to try and minimise the harm associated with pesticide use there's no advice that we can give them at the moment, or hasn't been. <coughs> so these projects try to address those problems. So the first one is to derive a new pesticide pollution reduction target to get rid of that 60% mass. For all those pesticides, or for many of the pesticides, we, we didn't have water quality guidelines. We're trying to derive new values. We're trying to set up a a baseline, that how bad is the situation now? And we're going to try develop a new method, or we have developed a new method for determining the mixture of up to 22 different pesticides, and we want to be able to develop models able to predict the, um, the toxicity of these pesticide mixtures in the waterways where we're not monitoring. And finally, addressing that last problem, I'm tr we're trying to develop a pesticide decision support tool. So let's have a look at the first project, <coughs> that pesticide reduction targets. Now this slide shows just one particular year for a couple of sites, and it's talking about showing the loads of the pesticides, the annual loads that are coming out from different rivers. So it's in kilograms, so you can see Fitzroy by far swamps any other waterway that's with, that is shown there. So if you are focusing on that target of reducing your loads, the total amount of pesticides by 60%, I hope you would all go, it's that one, do, do Fitzroy. That's where you should be focusing your efforts. And you would probably really focus on that. So if you could meet your target of reducing that by 60%, you would have met the previous target. But as I said, loads are not related to the toxic effects that pesticides cause. And when we converted those loads to take into account the differences in the toxicity, we get a completely different picture. All of a sudden, the Fitzroy really isn't that important. Yes, there's lots of pesticides coming out, but they're not the most toxic. And all of a sudden, it's not tebuthyron, which was the problem, it's diuron. So we see some of these other ones, which in terms of the total amount of pesticides being d released, were not very important, but they're now important because they're actually transporting more toxic chemicals out to the reef. So that's what we were trying to do, get over that problem that we may not be, by using this target, g doing the right thing or getting the best out of it. So we had our target in terms of loads, as an interim step, we tried to take into, just still use loads, but adjust them for the relative toxicity of them. But that was always just a halfway measure. And we did that because people were used to this idea of loads. 
So whereas we, what we wanted to do was get them to the concept of risk. So this was a halfway step. So what we've just done, we've had, we've now got the load expressed in terms of risk. So um, which is consistent with our water quality guidelines. So what is the risk? What percentage of species m might potentially be affected with, given those concentrations? And our target is actually to reduce the risk, okay? Not the load, the risk to the organisms. And that commenced this year. The other, one of the other problems I mentioned was we've we deal with, t traditionally, we deal with pesticides one by one. But what we did was we went back and we looked at um, about 2,500 samples that we collected. And we looked at how many pesticides were in, were in each of those. There was only about 10% of the samples which didn't have a single pesticide that we were analysing for. 1%, sorry, 9% had only one pesticide at detectable concentrations. And the vast majority, over 80% of them, contained mixtures of pesticides. They contained oops, anything from 2 to 23 pesticides, but the mean and the median were about 5. So it's clear if we're going to really try and address the risk to the reef, we have to deal with mixtures. We can't deal with individual chemicals. So what we did back while I was still here, um, working, well, working, I still am working, but physically located here, was we developed these catch or basin specific ecologically relevant targets. So those numbers you saw before of reducing it by 60%, 50%, 20%, they were sort of scientific guesses. Sort of like the sort of, we're saying, well, we know it's probably got to be at least that amount, but there wasn't a lot of ecological basis for those. So what we actually did was we then scoured the literature and we were looking to try and work out how, what's the concentration of sediment we can have in the water before it starts having, affecting the seagrasses and the corals, etc. So that's how we built those targets. And we made them specific for each catchment because catchments are in different stages of degradation, if you like. And very fortunately for us, it went through a public consultation phase. It was largely, um, no problems were associated with that, and they've been adopted into the Reef Water Quality Improvement Plan without change. So this just gives you an example of those targets. So for the different pollutants, for the different pollutants, I'm not touching that. I don't know what's quite happening. For the different pollutants in the different rivers, we have set different percent reductions for it to occur. The bigger the reduction that's needed obviously tells you the river is currently in a very poor state. The smaller the reduction, the closer it is to basically a natural condition. So that's what it was for uh, sediments and uh, nutrients. This is the target that we set for pesticides. And it was to protect at least 99% of aquatic species at the end of catchments from the effects of all pesticides. So the key words are at least 99% of species at the end of the catchment, which is the river mouth, and the effects of all pesticides. So very clearly we're saying you have to take into account the combined effects of the pesticide mixtures. And we want to be protecting the, by far, the vast majority of the <coughs> organisms. Now it's not working. So why did we pick, pick that particular target? Well, in the Australian and New Zealand water quality guidelines, we have these five different um, sets of, uh, well, it, they're based on different, different conditions of environmental, of the, of the environment. So for the highest level, which is like for national parks and Great Barrier Reef, etc., we obviously want to be protecting by f the vast majority of those species. And as you the uh, condition or the how much they've been modified decreases, the target is lower. But you may have a very highly disturbed system now, and so yes, you might be able to get away with that for the very short term, 
but there is always the expectation that you will be improving it to get it back to at least this level. Okay? But nonetheless, for the Great Barrier Reef, the appropriate level of protection is at least 99% of species. And why did we say at the river mouth? Hopefully this, uh, maybe don't look so much at the slide, but listen to the explanation. So if we aim to have the, the meeting the water quality guide, the target at the river mouth, then as that water comes out and it's diluted, obviously all of the reef will be, it will meet the target, okay? But if we set a lower target, say to protect 95% of species, then there is a zone before the water gets diluted and down to the c concentration where it will protect 99% of species. And so the lower the level of protection that we applied to the river mouth, that bigger that zone where some effects will occur. It's a sacrificial zone. We did not want to have a sacrificial zone in the Great Barrier Reef. So um, we made the target to be there at the river mouth. Oh, where is The next project was to derive new water quality guidelines uh, for those pesticides which I said where we didn't have uh, guideline values. So back in 2000, that's the previous version of the water quality guidelines. And then we had a complete revision of those and I was the co-author on that and the lead author on these. Uh, they were then extensively revised and they were just released uh, this year. If you want to go and have some light bedtime reading, feel free. Um, and basically, the importance of that is they are now, ha they, have, they have been adopted nationally and they are the means by which the new water quality guidelines for all those pesticides that we want to protect the reef from will be derived by. So you have to follow that methodology. I don't know why that red square moved down. It should be around glyphosate. But basically, this is some of the pesticide, or sorry, some of the chemicals that we're deriving new water quality guidelines for. The ones in the red, except for glyphosate, um, are pesticides. And there's even more pesticides. All of these are pesticides as well. Importantly, all of these have been measured out in the reef and in the catchments but we don't have any guidelines for those, so that's part of that process to derive those. We have actually derived values for all of those, and they're currently going through um, a technical review process now. What I'd like to do is very briefly explain how we do this, because some of these terms come up later. So what we do is we collate all the literature, and we then plot we calculate a single value for each species at which toxic effects start to occur. We then plot that as a cumulative distribution and then we fit a statistical, well, uh, statistical distribution to that and because it, we know that, that distribution mathematically, we can then calculate the concentration which will, should protect, theoretically, 99% of species, 95 90 or 80 percent, which are our values, that the default values that we use. So this red line is what we call a SSD, a species sensitivity distribution, because it's the distribution of the sensitivity of species that we have data for, for a particular chemical. The DGVs, DGV is the default guideline values, and they're the, in essence our water quality guidelines, and here are the four values. Through that revision, there's a new water quality guideline site where the protocols that I put up for before have been released. It was only released um, in August. I think you'd probably have to agree that is probably one of the dullest websites you've ever seen. That's not poor resolution. That's the image that it's there. It's, it's pretty overwhelming. Oops, it's being filmed. Hmm. At this stage, only three uh, new water quality guidelines, DGVs have been released, but as I showed you, all those other ones that were put up on the slide 
they're going through the technical review, and as they get through that, they will be added to the website. So that's another key component of the jigsaw that I've been sort of trying to work with. Now the third project, which is about the development of the pesticide baseline. The aim is to generate a pesticide risk baseline for all the waterways that go out to the reef. What it's hoped to, it will do is that it will, firstly, it will establish the current level of um, risk that the pesticides pose to the um, waters out in the reef. So it's, we're saying, as of 2019, this is how bad it is. And we have our target up there. The second thing that it will do is it will allow us to, uh, will indicate which rivers and which waterways are in the worst state and where we should be directing the investment and our efforts to. So, for example, if this is a completely hypothetical one, that's why I've called it River 1, if it's got a current, if the baseline is determined for it to be about 60%, so 60% of species are being protected, then we, we've got a fair idea of how much F or how far we have to improve. If River 2, however, is got a baseline of about no, protecting maybe 75% of species, we also know how far it's got to improve. But I think it would be quite logical to be directing more dollars towards that one and less towards this one. So it will help with that allocation of resources rather than in the past what they did was they basically said, well, we've got all these catchments, you all get the same amount of money. So the same amount of money is not really going to make much difference here. It would obviously make a bit more here, but it's not a particularly effective way of spending your investment to improve things. Finally, it allows us to track progress. How are we actually moving towards the target? So again, with our River 1, let's say we start there in 2020, and we might make nice, consistent progress towards the target. You would feel quite um, confident and relaxed that you are making good progress and you will get there in a relatively short time frame. Again, purely hypothetical dates and values. Whereas it might, might be possible if the um, catchment has a drastic change in the land use that it might start to get better, but if that particular industry is very intensive in terms of pesticide application or uses more uh, toxic pesticides, it could get worse. Irrespective of what's happening, whether it's improving over time, staying exactly the same or getting worse, this method will allow us to get an estimate of the toxic, combined toxic effect of those 22 pesticides. Um, but as I mentioned already, we don't monitor at all the waterways. Um, so what we obviously need to do if we're trying to estimate this baseline for every waterway, <coughs> pardon me, is we need to develop some models. Now Marco probably wouldn't call these real models, they're extremely simplistic um, models. You'd probably just call them relationships. But basically what we want to do is to try and model the pesticide mixture toxicity in terms of land use. So what's the percentage of each catchment being used for. So we might end up with some very simplistic relationships be where the toxicity, mixture of the toxicity is related to one dominant land use or it might be related to different land uses. So for example, you might think uh, if you have more conservation, you know, national parks in your uh, catchment, that that as that decreases and uh, other land uses increase, which use pesticides, obviously those two factors could control the toxicity of your mixtures. Now, you may well ask why we chose to try and develop these models using land use data. And basically the answer is twofold. First of all, each land use has registered pesticides that can be applied to that land. So logically, the pesticides, the land use controls the pesticides, 
that are likely to be in the waterways and likely to be having effects. In addition, there are some published papers which have actually shown those sorts of relationships between land use and biological effects. So um, Frederica Kroon found that vitelligen expression, which is an endocrine disrupting effect, that was more intense when you had a higher percentage of your catchment um, devoted to sugarcane. Um, Rebecca Woods, one of my PhD students, has found a negative relationship between uh, sensitive diatoms and the percentage of grazing and cropping. And there's some other work coming out here, again, which shows relationships between land use and other factors, such as the pesticides present, the complexity of the mixtures, and so on. So we thought that was a good basis for that. Time will tell. Obviously, to develop those models, we need land use data, and we need to have a method for actually estimating what is the, the, the combined toxicity of those 22 mixtures. We're very fortunate that Queensland does in fact have that sort of land use data, and they call it Q-lump. In Queensland, they love to put Q in front of everything. It means Queensland. So Q-lump is the Queensland land use mapping program. So we have that information. It's, it's really quite up to date. None of it is actually older than three years old. And what we've done, because we're mainly concerned with impacts of agriculture, is we're looking, we've broken those down into, well, in essence, eight land uses. So bananas, conservation, cropping, forestry, grazing, horticulture, sugarcane, and other. Anything else? But as you can see, and this is not atypical, the vast majority of the catchment is agriculture in, in the vast majority of these um, catchments. The, the, the towns slash cities are very insignificant in terms of the si their size, typically. So if we're going to try and uh, account for the mixtures, we had to, pesticide mixtures, we had to decide which ones to account for. So we thought that obviously we have to have a method for quantifying them first of all because otherwise you, if you don't know the concentration you can't really do anything. We wanted them to be regularly detected in our waterways because otherwise you're sort of putting a unnecessary effort into something which may not be a, a, an important factor. We needed to have an SSD, that species sensitivity distribution that we use to drive our water quality guidelines. And we also thought, well, let's only focus on chemicals that are actually registered for use in Australia because technically if it's not registered, it should not ever be imported, let alone applied. But who knows? The 22, we ended up with a selection of 22 different pesticides. Those are they. They cover quite a diverse range of pesticides. At this stage, they're still heavily dominated by um, herbicides. Um, and importantly, there are no fungicides there. And we're starting to get quite concerned about the level of fungicides, but also some interesting uh, indirect effects that are happening around um, fungicides. So we'll have to address that. But for the moment, that's what we've got. Um, so if I can just digress into a tiny little bit of theory about how pesticide mix or mixtures of chemicals interact. So this method was developed way, way back and it stood the test of time about how, uh, the, how the joint toxicity of chemicals works. So what they basically did, they, work, they div asked two questions. Do the chemicals have the same mode of action? or do they have a different mode of action? Mode of action basically means, do they exert their toxic effects by the, by the same means? Um, so alcohol, by and large, all has the same mode of action. It doesn't really matter if it's beer or scotch. Uh, absinthe is different. Um, but you know what I mean. They have the same mode of action. Same sort of thing with pesticides. The other question they ask is, do the chemicals, when they're in a mixture, uh, do they interact with each other or do they just act as if the other ones, uh, there's no interaction? And from that you get four different types of joint action. 
Concentration addition, so they have the same mode, but they don't interact. Uh, independent, where they have different modes of action, but and again, they don't interact. And then you have those two classes where they interact and may or may not have different modes of action. Importantly, the vast, the, the vast majority of the data that, that's available on the toxicity of mixtures shows that chemicals re, um, in mixtures do their, exert their toxicity by concentration, addition or independent action. In order to get synergism or antagonism, which we all hear about, you need to have these types of, or they will only occur when, with the, within those models. So in terms of increasing toxicity, synergism is the worst because the combined effect is greater than just uh, adding the two, um, having the each um, exerting an effect separately. Antagonism is probably the best case scenario because they're not as toxic when you combine them as acting individually. And concentration addition and independent action lie pretty much in the middle between those. And as I said, they're the vast majority of chemicals occur by that means. Um, for the mathematically inclined, here's a couple of very simple equations. It's just the models, the method that you use to calculate the, to the combined toxicity using the concentration addition model and the independent action model. Not surprisingly, if you look at the equations, the independent action model always gives a, a slightly lower estimate of the combined toxicity. Now, so what we then did was we looked at the literature and we said, is there any evidence that synergism is occurring with all those pesticides? And the answer was no. So because there's no evidence of synergism, we could then assume, given, given the volume of data, that, uh, li the conclusions from the literature, that if the chemicals uh, have the same mode of action, that they will conform to the concentration addition model. And if they have different modes of action, they will conform to the independent action model. It really, it's interesting. It's a, anyway, I'll d I'm digressing. I'll shut up. The, so if we combine the two... Th those two methods together, we can pretty much estimate the toxicity of any mixture at all, except if it's synergistic, and if that's the case, we, we can't use this method. We don't worry about antagonistic interactions because an these, give, these two methods give a higher estimate of the toxicity than if it was antagonism. So by doing that, we're being environmentally conservative. We're saying, if it was antagonistic, well, we're actually estimating it's got a, it is more toxic. So if we then base our actions on that, we will end up being more protective of the environment. So anyway, there's this method called the two-step method where we use both models and in order to determine if they have the same mode of action, what we do is we get their SSDs that I mentioned before and they should all be parallel. So if they have the same mode of action, all those SSDs should be parallel. And importantly, and I'm, I'm not going to go into it at all, but when you com combine these, the combined SSD should fit the uh, individual SSDs well. And if your chemicals do not have the same mode of action, you will find that the slopes are not parallel and also your combined SSD does not fit the SSDs for the individual as well. So they're the two tests we used and we did that to all of these uh, 22 pesticides. We first went to the literature and it's, they gave us these modes of action. And th there were nine uh, pesticides which belonged to the PS2s, four that were synthetic auxins, two which were ALS inhibitors, and then for all these other modes of actions, there was only a single pesticide. So we did those tests to look at the, if the SSDs were parallel and if the combined SSD fitted the data well. And what we found was, unfortunately, even though the literature is saying they 
should or they do exert their um, toxicity by the same means, with the data that we had, they weren't necessarily parallel or the model wouldn't fit them. So we actually had to break them down into smaller groups. Within each of those groups, still not touching it, within each of those groups, they do conform to those two rules. So they then became what we call our effective modes of action. And then within those, it's those boxes where you had multiple chemicals, we used the concentration addition model. That's step one. Then to combine, get the total toxicity, we combined all of those with using the independent action model. And basically, we worked out the total toxicity, because that's ultimately what we're interested in. But other people were saying, but oh, I want to know exactly what the photosystem two herbicides are contributing. Or what are all the herbicides contributing? What about the herb insecticides? So we broke it down into various ways. <coughs> so people could get a feel for, is it really the herbicides? Or is it one particular group of herbicides? Or is it the insecticides? which are causing the problem in different catchments, because it will vary from catchment to catchment. But nonetheless, the key driver for progress and progress towards target is the total value. What? Ah. Won't even bother explaining that. Come on. Uh, we developed an Excel spreadsheet for that and an R code for doing those calculations as well, and they're going to be released very soon. We've done the... We've used all our pesticide concentration data and we have calculated, made the, done those calculations um, for all the sites which started monitoring in 2009. So in 2009 we had, you know, had nine sites, but we've had quite a dramatic expansion. So um, now we have 38 sites. Um, and this shows you some of those outcomes. So. <coughs> These are just some of just a selection of different s rivers or creeks, and these are the total percentage of species which uh, <coughs> are being um, no uh, are, are being potentially uh, suffering adverse risks, having a, uh, adverse effects, and it's across three different years. The first thing is that as you go across the three years, they're remarkably stable. There's not a lot of change, really, from year to year. In some there is, but overall, there's not. So it tends to mean if there are management actions happening, they're not being particularly effective. It could just be that they're swapping from one pesticide to another, but it has, if it has roughly the same toxicity, it doesn't make any much difference. Another point I'd like to make is these green sites, their level of uh, percentage of species being harmed is not particularly high, you know, 4 to 11 percent. So they, they haven't got to do a heck of a lot to get to that target of only allowing um, roughly 1 percent of species. So they're probably in quite a good situation. And note one of those is the Fitzroy. Remember when I showed you the loads? We all, th we all well, I tried to lead you to say that was the worst. Well, it's actually not too bad at all. But still, it hasn't, it's, it's above the target, they will have to do some uh, additional work. These ones in orange are sort of more intermediate. Um, there is quite a substantial level of, of pr proportion of species being affected, but this is clearly our worst site. Um, anyone who could say, yeah, I'm happy with 60% of species being affected is not, uh, not a friend I want to talk to. Um, so, You've got this gradation from really reasonable, you know, still not meeting the target, but within QE of them, to moderate levels up to very high levels. And one of the things just from eyeballing that data is that gives me faith about the land use models will work, is that the green sites are dominated, they're almost exclusively grazing. The... Uh, yeah. Yellow, orange, amber sites have varying degrees of grazing and sugarcane, and the one which has the highest level of sugarcane is Sandy Creek. It's basically 50% of that catchment is sugarcane. 
So I'm reasonably confident. We haven't done that analysis yet, but that makes me feel a bit more confident. The decision support tool I'll go through quickly. Um, it's to give information to farmers, to the people who sell them the pesticides, the people who, uh, the agronomists and the um, extension officers who give them advice about what pesticides they should be applying. We want to give them information so they can try and choose less harmful pesticides. Obviously, the work that um, Chloe presented the other day would be a much better step, you're really taking it back this is much more a stopgap sort of approach, but nonetheless, it is something that uh, the farmers are willing to try and do, and they're actually really wanting this sort of information. It's being limited to only applying to sugarcane, but obviously some pesticides that are used on sugarcane are also used for other um, uses, <coughs> land uses. So it may be relevant to them as well. What's happening in terms of pest um, farmers is they go, what's the pest I've got? And they look at that and they go, okay, well, then they choose their product that they want to apply predominantly on those two factors, cost and how effective it is. If it's really cheap but it basically doesn't do the job, they're not going to apply it. There are other considerations. What Dad did, my dad always put on 2,4-D, at this rate, and I'll do the same. That's just locked in. Um, not trying to bag people's knowledge in any way at all, but it's just that that closed mentality of this is how it was done, and they're not prepared to think about outside of that. Advertising is phenomenal in the agricultural sector. They spend a lot of money on that. Another factor is that some of these farmers, uh, because some of the pesticides are not particularly expensive, they just apply it as an insurance policy. They don't actually have cane grub, but they'll apply it to try and prevent cane grub coming. So the complete antithesis to what we would be, if you don't even apply pesticide, we'd be saying. So that's another factor. And some of these things are just literally so cheap, in the long run, it's they feel it's better for them because it might uh, ensure a better yield, more money for them. What we want to do with this, pro this information is get them to have another leg to consider, not just cost, not just e efficacy, but really consider the environmental, potential environmental effects of the pesticides they choose. It's going to involve quite a bit of stakeholder focus groups because I could develop something and it would be fine in scientific circles, but it may be completely unusable and uh, unintelligible for the farmers. So we want them to guide us in actually um, how the information is conveyed to them, what exactly it, information they want, how they want it to be used. Some of the factors we, that we need to consider are shown here. So if you apply the herbicides to the crop, it will stay on the crop and in the soil, and the key factor is the persistence. At some point you will have rainfall and some of those pesticides will be transported either into groundwater, which ultimately ends up in the surface water, or just go straight off into surface water. Persistence and the concentration of the pesticides in the waterways are key to um, the biological effects and the risk they pose. So these are some of the factors that we need to know about in order to try and um, get a good, e a better estimate of the risk. Clearly, the toxicity is a key factor. And what we've done is using the water quality guidelines that we derived as in part of that other project, we've ranked them for the sugarcane pesticides from the most toxic at the bottom up to the least toxic here. The, they're ranked that way because the most toxic needs a much, much lower concentration to cause harmful effects. These ones need much higher ones. So uh, that's one hundredth and they're one thousand. So there's a large scale of order of magnitude in terms of their variation in toxicity. So for um, so if you had an insect an insect problem, the worst possible choice you could make would be fipronil. If you could use imidacloprid, 
we all know about the problems associated with that, it would slightly be better for aquatic ecosystems. Other ones would be better still. But as I just tried to mention to you, toxicity is not the only factor. The persistence, um, whether, you know, how soon it's likely to rain, um, etc. So with this feedback that we're trying to get from the farmers, we're trying to, for example, tell, get them to say to us, no, nah, that option, that, that won't work for them. So one option is something like this. We just present the herbicides uh, in, from worst to best, and if they are using product P, um, then it's easy. Anything, anything would be better than that. So Q to V would be an improvement. Might, you know, if it's only using Q, not too much of an improvement, but nonetheless. If they're using C, then only really D, E, F and G would work, and so on. But if they're using P, the least in harmful insecticide, well really they can't do better than that based on the, what's available, but maybe they should then be looking at, are they, um, could they put it in banded sprays? Have they got water retention ponds to stop the water actually flowing off their fields? So even if they're using the best, there are still methods to improve the um, environmental outcome. Another possible way is to just do a simple bimodal, uh, or it could be three or four, but rank them into high or low toxicity, and also in terms of their mobility. How easily do they come off the soil and the plants? Because they're obviously important. And then combine that with information about whether it's the wet or the dry season, and is there how far into the future is the next weather forecast. So obviously a highly mobile and highly toxic chemical which falls into that quadrant, you would not be wanting to apply that in the wet season when you're likely to be having rain in the next couple of days because the vast majority of that will just go straight into the water and out. You would probably be wanting to, in, this sort of if in that sort of scenario, if you had to, be putting on a chemical which has, um, binds to the soil and does not leach off, for example. So we could combine that sort of information to, as another option. Um, so we're really hoping, because the farmers are actually actively asking for this type of information, that that will lead to changes in their practices. We will know if that's in fact the case because in two ways. Firstly, the, um, the current uh, paddock to reef monitoring program has people who go out and do surveys of land management practices. So they survey people and they get them to tell them what they're doing. What pesticides are you applying? What's the regime? What sort of fertiliser regime do you have? Um, but in addition, because that information um, is not always 100% reliable. You know, firstly, you're not doing it to all farmers, obviously. So you're doing a subsample. Also, there's perhaps um, farmers forget exactly what they've done, um, etc. So irrespective of that, we have the catchment loads monitoring program, which monitors the pesticides. So if there are changes in the pesticides um, regime that farmers are using, then it will turn up in those. And it will also show up in the cumulative, the measure of the combined toxicity of our pesticides that we're doing. Because if they're using less harmful pesticides, that will drive down that value to be closer to the target. Ugh. Just showing that some of these things, the projects have already got, uh, well, if you like, impact, but it's certainly been uh, adopted into national um, documents and policy documents so if they don't yet have real outcomes, they're likely to in the next few years, hopefully. And thank you very much for listening. I'd just like to acknowledge CORE and the other university and the Department of Environment and Science where I've also done part of this work. Obviously all my colleagues, co-authors and students and my family for putting that work in. Thank you very much. <laughs>